Rick, Rick thank, uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to the conversations. It's always good to, uh, to, to talk to you. Well, thanks, thanks, Pierre and Jeremy. I mean, when I heard about the society and these uh, various kinds of events that you host, I was like, it, you know, this is just such a wonderful idea. Um, you know, let me explain a little more what I mean by that. I mean, the theory crowd has always been small. You know, I remember when I came out of Stanford, I was thinking about what should I write my dissertation on? The big choice at the time was, do you work with Dembski or Beaver? And everybody's saying, are you sure you wanna work with Joel? There aren't many theorists, you know? It's always been the same. In fact, when I look and see how many people are, at, are, are coming here, they're probably more now than ever. <laughs> it's just, so it's important to have some historical back, background. I mean, I, when I went to Chicago and there was no other theory person in, in uh, on the faculty with me. In fact, Ron Dye, they also just hired and he was, but he was an econ economics professor. So, um, you know, the theory is always a little low and there's no reason for that now because you can have forums like this. So thanks so much uh, for having me. Um, even though I'm PR, I'm gonna blame you for making me feel old. Uh, <laughs> not, that, not that that takes much these days, <laughs> you know. Anyway, so thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Rick. Um, again, the idea of AES conversations is that for guests like you to have perhaps more interactions uh, as host um, as well as uh, the audience. So if you have any questions, um, uh, please use use chat and I think uh, uh, Jeremy will help me manage uh, to get people to 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 ask questions. But, but I'll use the first uh, initial uh, time with uh, uh, with Rick to maybe set up some uh, some conversation topics, and then we can go. Uh, we'll see how how this uh, how this goes. It's supposed to be a little bit more free, free flowing than uh, than the typical talk. Now, usually we hear guests um, talk a, a little bit about the overview uh, of their work first. Uh, but with you, Rick, I, I think I, I like to set this up uh, as a, as a way of background to get to this real world problems that, uh, that I started off with. So um, I, I think like many in the audience, so I'm gonna make you feel old again, sorry. <laughs> uh, like many, many, uh, many in the audience, I suspect, uh, my first interaction with you, Rick, is actually through your work, right? So um, I, when I learned agency theory in Florida, um, oh, I, I, I read your, uh, your paper on, on the audit independence, uh, along with, uh, you know, uh, Forrest Isdale's work on stewardship, uh, Blackwell theorem, uh, Rick Lambert's work on early work on two-period agency, John Christensen's work on communication in agencies. We can draw the draw the lines there, and then, of course, uh, I think a lot of us uh, read your work on on capital budgeting uh, with uh, with Ep, uh, with Eppen, uh, Fellingham, uh, controllability stuff with Joel, and then off you go, right? So. Again, um, my favorite paper is actually Ant Antor Demsky and Ryan on recognition, which inspired my, my dissertation. Um, so I've always felt, right, that you're just a classic accounting theorist, right? So you take some robust accounting idea uh, and then give it a rigorous economics, especially information economic meaning, and then do analyze economic consequences, yeah, you name it. Uh, but then I learned of your, you had this, what I call a double life uh, as a high-flying accounting practitioner, so to speak. Um, so my first set of questions is, is for you are like, so first tell us about that a little bit. Uh, what I meant the work that you did on compensation and also these uh, Madoff re uh, resolution. And also for those of us who don't know, like tell us a little bit of uh, what, what you and your partners did, what's the nature of the work and what attracted you as an accounting theorist there. And then finally, perhaps what's, what's surprising, right? From a, from a purely accounting theorist perspective. Uh, I know that's a lot, but let's get started somewhere there. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Pierre. I mean, uh, I've been very fortunate in my career to be often in the right place at the right time, starting at, with my undergraduate degree at Oklahoma State where, so I have a classic accounting degree. Uh, we can talk about that at length sometime. They uh, rec they recruited me and a few other people you might know, like Bill Kinney, uh, Jim Boatsman. Uh, there's a lot of, just like Ohio State, there are a lot of people that from uh, my age and a little older that, that came from Ohio State because they recruited accounting professors. Oklahoma State did the same thing with a guy named Milton Anderson. Now, so my, my undergraduate is sort of just a traditional accounting background. Um, uh, 
you know, as you were talking, Pierre, I was reminded that actually my first big uh, dip into the real world was as um, a consultant for the big 654 <laughs> accounting firms on independence issues. Because uh, it's probably the late 90s when Hal Levitt was the chairman of the SEC and the accounting firms were under all kinds of pressure for their to, uh, because of their consulting work and, and independence was an issue. They, they set up a short-lived um, regulatory body called the Independent Standards Board. And uh, th there was not such a thing This is as the Center for Audit Quality now. Um, they stole my business, actually, <laughs> because <clears throat> I used to sit and, and you know, the, the accounting firms themselves, because of antitrust issues, couldn't directly communicate with things. And they liked to have someone sort of prepare their answers to the regulatory regulators and, and so forth. But, you know, I, I mentioned that because that's basically kind of a classic industrial organization problem. You know, what's the limits of the firm? What, what should determine what a firm does or does not do? And, uh, and that, of course, dovetailed with my, um, you know, my interest in, in auditor independence. I have to say, you know, at the time, uh, some of my arguments were, in retrospect, uh, you know, good economic arguments, but I think a little naive with respect to what organizations can and can't manage to do internally. I think we still face a lot of, of challenges with respect to that, you know, that is, uh, we, we can come back to that, you know, sort of if you want. But, um, you know, then I think mostly the things you're talking about, so I did that, you know, for quite a while. And then, then I was a senior associate dean when that title actually meant something different. Now everybody's like the deputy dean of the universe and intergalactic commander of everything. But, you know, it was, I was just a senior associate dean. And, um, you know, I did appointments and everything here. So when that, when that, as that, as those duties sort of wound down, I was kicking around, what am I going to do? And this is just about the time that, um, that in the right around, God, the turn, I have to say the turn of the century and not mean 1899 to 1900, 1999 to 2000, <clears throat> when after the, um, the financial crisis in, in 2002, it was pretty obvious to me that uh, they were going to change the rule, the accounting rules on accounting for executive stock options. I mean, that just has never made any sense, right, from the point of view of intuitively, at least, you know, they, they, treating everything as basically a capital transaction. And, you know, remember, if you if you granted options where the stock price is equal to the exercise price, there was no expense taken or anything. And that was, you know, known to be sort of uh, ridiculous. And then uh, it, now the FASB had tried to change the rules for that in, in I think, 96 it was. I think Bob Swearinger was on the FASB um, at the time, and he told me a story about going to Silicon Valley when they were proposing this and you know, happy to escape with his life because they, you know, people were so you know, out of shape about this. But that their efforts got beaten off at the time or awarded off because um, the excuse was that, oh, we, we don't know how to calculate the value of these options. And so, you know, we don't know, to, you know, we can't get a good number. So this valuation was, was claimed to be the problem. You know, despite the fact that obvious contradictions is, well, then how do you know how many to grant somebody if you can't, if you can't calculate the value? Why don't you just grant them all to me, I would say to people, and then, you know, that didn't go over very well. But anyway, so, um, so also at that time, uh, uh, Steve Ross, besides being my Yale colleague for a long time, uh, was also a friend, and, and it, he, he had some business interests with Dick Roll that were kind of winding up. And Dick Roll in particular was interested in starting up something involving trying to estimate values for executive stock options. And so I got together with those two guys and we formed a, a company called Compensation Valuation. And the idea was that, again, we were just gonna provide valuation estimates. And, um, uh, you know, so we sort of went off from there. So I that, that experience led me to see two different kinds of things. Number one is the marketing of some financial reporting supporting business. You know, I tried to do theories about, you know, why, 
why do our accounting firms so successful doing consulting? Is there some sort of economy of scope? I think Joel and I wrote, wrote a paper on this, you know. So you would look at some sort of economy of scope in production. And I was always skeptical of that because my experience was, little though it was, I worked for Arthur Anderson a couple of summers, was that, you know, the consulting side and the audit side didn't talk to each other that much. You know, the, the, the standard line would be, well, the auditors can kind of uh, learn a lot of things and they about the needs and so forth and they, or client, things that would do the client some good. And then you, you tell the consultants and so forth. And so I was... So the idea was to, to say that there's some sort of production externality uh, that, um, that because of the audit knowledge that the consultants sort of knew a lot more about it and were therefore able to be very efficient at supplying these services. And I was always skeptical of that because I didn't think they, they communicated that much. Well, it took about five minutes in practice for me to see what's really going on. There's a marketing externality. You know, that is, you know, I you know, formed this corporation with, you know, two of the giants in finance. And so the issue is, was, or can we go convince some company? Now, th their methods, by the way, involve uh, that they, uh, we, I, I could go to, way into this, which would, would it be, you know, you, you, need a, you need a volatility model and an exercise model, basically, right? And so exercise is problematic, but the volatil volatility model, I watched how Steve and Dick analyzed implied volatilities uh, on traded options and extended that to um, that idea or ideas they got from that or data they got from that to, um, to construct a, a, uh, a term structure, if you will, a volatility that you could use. One, you know, one of the issues with executive options was that they're much longer lived than the options that are being traded. Okay, so I saw that kind of how that, um, how they, they did that. But then, the, so besides the marketing, well, I guess my point is though, you, you know, you couldn't have had better partners and we would try to say, how do you make an appointment with, um, I'll give you a good example, Pepsi, Pepsi, okay. Indra, Indra Nui had been Steve's student at Yale. and <laughs> She was president of Pepsi. We never got in front of them to present our methods you know, even though they needed to buy the services and so forth. And, um, you know, the, the, the kind of model I think that would might actually work there would be sort of a costly search model. That is, if you think about um, the, 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 the problem of a CFO or whatever, you know, they, they have limited attention to give to any particular thing. And so, the fact is the audit firm is always in there and they can always call up the CFO and say, hey, I know you're gonna need you know, some estimates for stock options. How about you come in with us? So that was the whole thing. The other thing, so, so there's that, that whole aspect of the audit market, but you know, the other part of that was, um, I got to see the implementation of a complex accounting rule and how firms actually did this. And it was really pretty interesting because, because this, this was a rule about, stock options and executives had obvious a lot of financial interest and paid a lot of attention to this. You know, I would, we would go around and, and, and talk to um, uh, firms and we'd be talk. first of all, we'd be talking to committees of people that maybe had never met each other. So somebody from finance, somebody from HR, somebody from, you know, uh, all kinds of different places and financial reporting. <clears throat> but they were keenly interested in, this is what really got me, they were keenly interested in how this was going to be operationalized. Now, a lot of the companies had already made footnote disclosures of this stuff before. Let me tell you, the, uh, how seriously they took, we're actually going to recognize this in the accounts versus it goes in footnotes, not even in the same galaxy. You know, that, that they just, uh, as soon as you said you're going to build it into the formal numbers, everybody's like, bang, locked in, in a way. <clears throat> I mean, you know, people were paying us to do studies of, you know, exploratory studies of how will this affect their numbers or what kind of numbers are you going to get? They had numbers in their own, in their own footnotes already, you know? So, so, so geography matters a great deal. That's what you're saying. It's, it, it's huge, Okay. Now, if I could editorialize a little bit, 
the whole notion of disclosure that the emphasis on well if we got a problem we'll just disclose something somewhere you know it's missing something big time you know it's it, it it's missing somehow when you try to fit something in the real structure of what we have that is well basically you're going to recognize something so what does recognize mean it means that we have we keep records by imposing an identity you know the accounting identity i like to think of it like this assets minus liabilities for in a for profit that's defined to be equity in a not for profit that's defined to be net assets okay and i believe by the way and i've been working on this for a long time that that's the way we should teach accounting from the start but that's a, that's a whole other you know conversation but i think as a you know, my training, my research training and training in math may be a little more sensitive to the difference between an identity and an equation. And, you know, um, you know, E equals MC squared is an equation that could be wrong. There's no way that you're going to have assets minus liabilities not equal to equities on any balance sheet that's prepared correctly, right? Because it's an identity we impose. And by imposing that identity, if you will, we sort of give up a degree of freedom. If you know any two of those numbers, you know the third. Anyway. Uh, so, so Rick, that then the story on how disclosure and recognition matters so much to practitioners, um, does, does, what does that mean? So, 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 so does that mean that like, if I think something like that, that, that there is a fundamental fault line, right, in at least the history of accounting thoughts, which is on my mind a lot lately, um, is between the so-called measurement perspective right. and the information perspective, right? So if you if you if you read history and and you know the, the revolution that took place, and and so the philosophical difference um, to me is is very deep, right? It's 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 basically how we have to make a choice. It's it's not an outcome of some research. It's a it's a choice that we have to make to view, uh, in some sense, the nature of accounting theory, right? So either we the nature of accounting theory is to develop some proper measurement, or this kind of should I be thinking about this recognition stuff, um, like what to measure, does the measure exist, and how to design it if if it does, and versus. Uh, if some, in some sense, the you know the the Feltham's information evaluation, right? This is like, you know, what who demands information? What is the decision context? Who supplies the information? What is the equilibrium and all that? So these are the fault lines, right? Now, uh, now, do you mean that the what you saw in, in these experiences that you mentioned, either uh, especially the later one, right? This this implementing a complex accounting uh, standards. Does that have anything to say? Did, did, you, did, did that affect your thinking about now thinking back as, as a theorist? Because uh, I'm sure you, you, you're familiar with the history that I just you know, was, was uh, saying. Yeah, I lived a lot. I lived a lot of that because I was sort of on, you know, the, the generation after the people that had fought the information perspective versus uh, measurement perspective wars, <laughs> which the information perspective won, by the way. Yeah. But it doesn't matter because everybody, I, I could, um, I almost explode at, uh, physically explode about how, with how sloppy accounting people are with the use of the word measurement. Um, you know, we quantify a lot of things. We produce numbers, right? But a measurement is a special kind of quantification. And, and again, I, I, I was fortunate enough to have uh, choice theory from David Krep, well, Tom, uh, Michael Harrison and, and, Dave, and I was David Krep's TAs. And it basically, there were a, a time at which people were taking very, very, very seriously the theory of measurement. What, can, what does it take to measure something? What is it not? Okay, well, one of the things you have to do to measure something is you have to be able to define it, right? Uh, another thing you need to be able to do, though, is that well, a, a pure measurement starts with an empirical relation system, that is some objects and maybe just binary relations among those objects. Now, to be measurable, the properties of that underlying binary relation have to line up with the properties of numbers. So, for example, it, any, two number, any two numbers are comparable in the sense that real numbers in the sense that one's bigger, as big as the other or vice versa, right? 
So does that mean when we're measuring income, does that mean that one, you know, if we, it's, we got to operationalize this, we have to define income and we have to have some sense about when is one person's, you know, income bigger than another. Well, the fact is, you know, that's sort of crap from the get go, because we know there are cases where income is higher, but, but, but the firm's actually worse off. So however, however you want, and, 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 and Beaver and Dembski wrote a marvelous paper about when is it possible to measure income? And the answer is in perfect and complete markets, you can do it because all you have to do is, uh, you know, use the prices that are generated in those markets and, you know, take the difference in wealth at the end minus the beginning and various, and that's it. The trouble is nobody cares about information in such a world because the information is all carried by all the prices. So uh, I, I go crazy at the mental habit of saying, I have measured a bunch of things. Now let me figure out what's wrong with the measures. You know, so, so for example, uh, let me give you another, I know I'm ranting on this, but you give me some time for this. So, you know, a, a psychologist at, after some point would give up very quickly saying that they're going to measure intelligence. You know, it's multidimensional, it's undefinable. It doesn't prevent us from trying to quantify certain aspects of it. That is, what do we do? We give people tests and they answer questions on the tests and we compute a, a numerical score. But that score is called an intelligence quotient. It's not called a measure of intelligence. And I think I use that example because you can start seeing the implications for using the word measure, right? You use the word measure when you're trying to imply that you've got something, your number is much more meaningful, man. It's got some real direct meaning. And then you only sort of back off that. So anyway. Um, well, you, you basically suggest separating quantification exercise and yes. measurement exercise. I would only say that that we measure things when the when the the necessary conditions for the construction of a measure actually exist, and one of them is the underlying binary relation has to be complete, and some sort of transitivity. I mean, we could go into all sorts of things about the weakest possible yeah, necessary so, conditions. So maybe let's come back to the to the stock option example that you were using. That's got got us started. And one of the questions yeah. in the chat asks about. There are, on the specific stock options, there's these ex ante measures, uh, fair value incentive you know, on the grant, and then compensation that's actually earned on, the, I guess, on the vesting, and then the realized, of course, as, uh, exercise. Now, do, do, in your, in, you know, it is, does, th this seems to be a measurement versus uh, 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 versus information type of uh, type. Uh, discussion uh, um, among, the, um, among the three, are you saying that in your exercise, in, in your uh, real world work, um, are you measuring or are you, are you providing yeah. information? Okay. Providing information. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you have to have some, you know, this is very tough to really get a good theoretical handle on, right? Because you have to have some intuition for why are you constructing this or that as assessment of, what, of, of things, right? So, you know, we have some vague idea as to what it is we're trying to get at. What is that idea? That idea is that if a firm uh, compensates somebody by issuing them stock options, they have done something, right? They have they have transferred something of value. Of value. Uh, you know what that is, how we value it. Uh, you know, I don't know. Again, when you know, let's let's suppose that the thing they transfer was shares of stock instead of stock options, we wouldn't have any trouble trying to understand, figure out, you know, what, how to, how to actually, I have to say it, even though I never like to say the word, we have to, to measure the value of what was given up is you just look at if it's, if stocks traded in a well-functioning market, you just look at the price, right? But accounting operates in worlds where mm, the markets are not quite so complete and perfect, right? So again, this is the lesson of Beaver and Dembski. And so you get the, you get very interested in the frictions that are being solved in one way or another. There's an interesting in, um, experiment, a, a thing called an, in, an entity called Zion's Bank Corps decided that they were going to solve this problem of figuring out um, uh, numbers to use in the accounting 
for stock options by creating a, a market for tracking securities. So they tried to create, they did create actually, and they had a couple of rounds of, uh, of it, um, of a market where you, know, you, you could make securities that paid off a, a dollar when employees of a certain company had made this much uh, profit, or had reaped that much profit. And so that was kind of an interesting interplay between, you know, an attempt to actually make a market for something that is, uh, you know, is, is part of a very big non-market transaction, right? That is, um, we could go into also great lengths about how people have appropriated the word market to mean everything. This drives, this is another thing that drives me crazy. Um, you know, one of my, the people that influenced me a lot was say Williamson. Oliver Williamson, and you know, one of his first books was Markets versus Hierarchies. You know, markets are markets lie on one extreme of the way we organize things, and and probably a nonprofit like a university occupies another, and, and a government occupies other other extremes. But to say that everything's a market sort of means nothing. You 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 take away the meaning of that. So let me so so the two words, and I know this is kind of weird, but as a theorist, I kind of think like this, right? So if you use measurement to describe every quantification, then you're devaluing the word. Then measurement doesn't mean anything, right? Because you're just using it all the time. And the same thing with market. If you say there's a market for every, you know, any particular thing, oh, marriage, oh, there's a market for marriage. Well, you've just devalu, you know, you, you've just ruined basically or, or made uh, empty. You've made empty the, the word market because it, it's everything. Now, in the political sphere, of course, people like to do this. So economists like to say there's a market for everything because that brought, that gives them maximum broad territory to, to do what they want to do. But you know, theoretically, or, or you know, from a from that so, an analytical point of view, that's just bull. So, so I, I like this. So, so you let's say uh, uh, you you mentioned a couple of things. One is information school one. So we are now yeah. mostly information theorists. But we still deal with a profession that, uh, quote unquote, provide, I guess, quantification or provide, you know, like, uh, now, one thing that we do as, you know, as, as a theorist, we, we write papers is that we try to capture that, right, with, but, but, but I struggle on this, right, so we, uh, the, kind of the best tool that we have, at least in my mind, to do that capturing is uh, to to basically conjecture or or assume or, or some or derive informational properties, and that's usually uh, a, 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 a stay away from the detail level of accounting practice, and we model them uh, using statistical assumptions like covariances or likelihood ratios. As, as instead of really like what, what some people call opening this black box, right. that is what, whatever imperfect things that, that occupies between markets and hierarchies. Right. And all the things. So based on your experience, now you of course have done that and a lot of us are still doing that. So what is your, what is, what is, what is, what, what is something that you can tell us about, about that? I mean, I, I presume we'll continue to do that, but what, what, what can be in, what that practice can be informed by what you are, what, what you've seen? Well, 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 first of all, you know, uh, one of the reasons I liked hanging around with Steve Ross a lot was because that he had a very sharp sense of what's, what's commercial work and what's academic work. Okay. You know, and, and, and partly I, I, I you know, I, I came to realize that, that part of his sensitivity to that was actually eugenics. I don't know if how many people know about this, but you know, you go back far enough in the day, and people were trying to do things like, we we will we will measure people's intelligence by the circumference of their skull. Okay, so this is you know this led to all sorts of racial discrimination. So he was very he was also a, an undergraduate Caltech physics major that had classes with people like Feynman and Murray Gelman and people like that. So Steve didn't like to. Uh, he didn't he, he didn't like to say something was sort of academic unless it really was, you know, unless he could prove it or whatever. On the other hand, he also didn't have any trouble acting in the world. Right. You, you just don't have to say, you know, you can be guided by your you know, theory. But the fact is, there's almost no decision in the world that we know exactly how to do. Right. 
you know, what do we do? I mean, we analyze, we gather some facts, we analyze something, and then you make a call. I call it making a call, right? We just gonna say, we say we're gonna do things one way or another. And this gets back to, I think, some of your the question about um, uh, following accounting all the way, the, the something uh, in the accounts all the way through to the ultimate realization. So I'm gonna I'm gonna gonna sort of come back to that. Um, um, because like in, um, um, like, you know, in the, it, so let's take a, executive stock options, you know, it, to really think about how they were going to do this, there were a lot of, the FASB had a lot of things they had to specify, right? So one of them is how you make the first entry, right? <laughs> that is, it, how are you going to recognize, you know, the issuance of stock options? Another question is then, as time goes by, what kind of adjustments do you allow? Right. That is, you know, are you going to, uh, 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 if you will, adjust, you know, revise your estimate of um, a value every period? And I think the international accounting standard, IFRS, I think, uh, I think you do this because we, by the way, as a commercial person selling services, I loved that. I said, oh, you've got to calculate this stuff all the time. You know, you got to, it's just, you know, you know, you don't want to just sit back and wait. Oh no, you we, you've got to have a stream of that. So I, you know, that's um, you know, partially I'm lampooning that a little bit, but you got to understand when somebody's from coming from practice, you know, that's really their motive, right? Is to sell things and to, you know, and to make money. And whether that actually happens or not depends on what comes out of the process. But you know, let me. I want to go back a little bit to the FASB. You know, they can never write really why a rule is why it is, right? That, that all the FASB rulemaking lingo is political speech, right? It it's their political rationale for why they're doing the rule this way versus that way, and they can never say it's to control the moral hazard of accountants, for example. <laughs> But they can't say that, right? Um, so they have to say, you know, sort of they have to couch all their explanations in in words of measurement and you know some sort of stuff like that, um, and and so that's what they do, right? Uh, but anyway, so when you when you when you do something more practically, you come up a, you come up against, well, what are your standards for getting something done? You just have to. You know, we have to have a method of doing something and we have to move on, right? So the, the where the accounting structure comes in though is like, let's go back to the FASB problem about what do you recognize initially? And then how do you make adjustments? And then at the tail end, when, when that deal is finally over, the options are either exercised or they lapse un, um, unexercised. The question is, are you or are you not going to, I guess the accounting language, language of that is true up at that mm -hmm. stage, right? And um, uh, now, why do we have that latter part in there? Why, why, why is it that we ever, that we always, <laughs> you know, make the accounts agree over a longer period of time with what actually happened? Now, by the way, when I say that, we could mischaracterize something as a as a capital transaction versus an expense or whatever that you know that there's all kinds of issues with that. But the fact is that the ultimate realization is going to get figured into the accounts. We're going to have to record that. Now, why do we do that? Um, you know, I think you've got to in those things you, you you need to start thinking about the fact that we have to discipline this process of record keeping. You know that is. If you you know what what is accounting? I like to I like to tell my students and others it's like what separates counting from accounting, right? Counting is also the assignment of numbers. Accounting is telling the story. You know that is something about meaning and so on. Now this is where again our view of accounting just in terms of the statistical properties is what one of the things you asked me about earlier. You know, it's kind of a weakness, right? Because we can not we can talk about probability distributions and distribution and conditional distributions of this or that, 
but getting at kind of deeper methods of meaning. So why does it matter what words we put on things? You know, well, we think it does matter, but our economic theories, are, uh, if I could take a couple of minutes to just to kind of roll through those, right? For you, the first thing that happens when you do put an, put an information perspective down is that you, you come across, well, in a sing, you think about a single person decision problem and more information you know, is at least as good as less. If there's costless disposal and costless processing, we immediately go to there, right? And then you, know, then you run into the fact that, well, that doesn't rank every possible information set of alternatives because some, you know, uh, to, to, to measure the quality of information that is, we, that, uh, you know, the only way we can do that is fineness. And we can have two information systems that aren't comparable. That is what that means is there's no number I can put on there, uh, one real number and put on these systems and have this work. Okay, so anyway, so you get in, so you get into Dembski's impossibility standards and all that stuff. Blackwell theorem stuff. Yeah. Black, Blackwell theorem and then Dembski's in, in, um, impossibility. Uh, impossibility thing. Okay, so then, so that, so you know, plow forward anyway. You know that so, so this this had Sidney Davidson actually came by Oklahoma State when I was learning some stuff about Joel's things, and I was giving him the. Uh, just more information, the Blackwell theorem thing, which of course he already understood. And then he said, he said to me, well, why don't we just dump the general ledger on their doorstep then? And I shut up for a while as, an, as, a, as a 20 year old or whatever, but there's a problem we have, right? How, how do you explain the fact that, you know, we, we like to think of accountants as disclosing information. We're, we're producers of information, you know, we're also big destroyers of information. Right. That is, you know, yeah, it's true that it, that what we start with are original records where we capture a lot of things and we create information. And then what do we do? We destroy a bunch of it by aggregation and by labeling and putting into different categories and by imposing constraints like assets minus liabilities is defined to be equity. And my story has to has to preserve that identity. So if you want to get into that, we have a little, you know, then you're going to get into, well, if you have not a single person, you, you can't explain that from a single person decision perspective, right? It just doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, without uh, without information, pro some sort of model of information processing costs. So, so we didn't want to do that. So what do we do? Well, well let's go to multi-person settings. Well, in multi-person settings, you can throw information in and make things worse, right? So we know there's markets for limits and stuff like that. And so that gives you some reasons reasons for destroying information. You know, I mean, Ron Dye's disclosure cost paper, you know, there can be some cost of disclosing and so on. But then, and no, you know, great, no doubt, you know, true. But all, you know, by the way, the, the things that I'm going to talk about are things that had their, it, you know, their start back then, and I'm sure they're much further developed now, but, you know. Yeah. So, but, you know, so uh, that's where economic theory set for a long time, actually. As I remember, our, after the financial crisis, we have this CEO Institute thing here. And one of our guys, Jeff Sonnenfeld, is always getting together. You might have read some stuff. He's getting together CEOs for all kinds of stuff. And so after the financial crisis, he gathered a bunch of these people. And Steve Schwartzman was one, by the way. And, and, the, and, and, and they were talking about, well, why... Why are we in this problem after the financial crisis? You know, what happened? Markets froze up, oh, what happens? And Bob Schiller said some of the great thing. He said, well, the only reason we know that markets don't work so well in economics, our only theory is information. There's gotta be some sort of information going on. So let me let's dig into that. And, um, you, you know, that was before Bob won the Nobel Prize, but it, it was kind of an indication. He just cut through, you're talking about what good is theory? There is an example, right? We, he, you know, cut through all the crap and say, like, what's the fundamental issue here? And and there's no doubt that a lot of it is information. In fact, there are all kinds of people in biology and physics now, and they're viewing their professions, as I know from talking to John, you and John Fellingham, as information science professions. So, so let me let me come back to the. Point, one point that you mentioned that the way that we do uh, information, uh, you know, uh, quantification is different in the sense that we do accounting as opposed right. to simply counting. Right. right. 
discount. Um, so, so this is where I want to bring up. Uh, I want you to maybe tell us a, a little bit about your your Madoff experience or that 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 exercise. Right. Where uh, does that map? Of course, you come in much later, so so we don't have a lot of time. But but I want to at least to, to to link yeah. that up to see say a little bit about that. That may that may be helpful. Well, this is the, you know I I just learned so much from this. Let me give people the background. So um, so after Madoff blew up. Right and, and and goes bankrupt. So you have all this litigation for years about uh, who's got standing and who's really lost and who hasn't and all that stuff. I didn't have anything to do with any of that. But after that, after everybody had sorted that out, then what happens is they set up liquidation trust or liquidating trusts for various parties. Okay, so so there were some um, feeder funds to Madoff, and a couple of the smaller ones were the Greenwich Century funds. They were part of the family of the Fairfield Century Funds that Walter Noel, who's a Connecticut guy, that had set up. And all they did was, all these funds did was raise money, turn it over to Madoff, okay? And then Madoff did, so, so they went bust too, right? Now, uh, so I come in after, you had, all the lawyers have been at it for years and years and they formed a liquidating trust and then they need a liquidating trustee to somebody just to oversee a couple of things. Number one is the way you compensate people is you go gather up money from the net winners, that is people that took out more cash than they put in, and then you distribute that to the net losers. And there's got to be rules associated with how far back you can look and all kinds of stuff. So, um, you know, so I had, I, I had, some direct experience with that. So I got in on the inside and I got to see, you know, I think I had, I think there were sort of less than 150 net losers in the 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 crowd that I that I dealt with. And so I got to see, you know, how much they lost, what were the terms and all this. And this is really a huge kind of shocking thing to me, which was that um, early on, um, one of the lawyers passed me a spreadsheet and that had, you know, like I said, how much did people lose and when was their first investment, let's say. So of course, if you think about it, the people who lost the most were the people who invested most recently. You know, so there was somebody that lost $50 million in a month, right? Because those are the people left holding the bag. You know? So I really had to think, I, you know, it really caused me to think a lot about Ponzi schemes and, and then I realized, it dawned on me something that Jim Olson had been trying to tell me since 1975, I think, that the most important thing accountants do is separate capital transactions from income transactions or operating transactions. And I never knew, you know, it just didn't, that, you know, I, I said, of course, that's kind of what we do. But then I realized, no, how fundamental that is. Because what, because what a Ponzi scheme artist does is he, in, he or he, mostly it's he, um, invites, <laughs> encourages people to make the following mistake. That is, you know, if, you, if Pierre, if you invest in my Ponzi scheme and you're an early investor, and so I'm going to pay you back more than you invested to get you as a reference then for other people. So you give me a thousand bucks and I give you 1500 back. You're not, you, you're not thinking Rick is giving me stolen money. You're not thinking Rick is giving me somebody else's money. You're thinking of, hey, I made an investment, PI Pierre made an investment, and look, it paid off. Isn't this great? Right. So, but you know, so what society needs to run is somebody trying to assess who is creating value, who's destroying value, and who's redistributing value. Because when you get down and dirty with it, when you go down to the more of the atomic level, um, you know, that's really crucial, right? Because, you know, you know I'm, I mean, the analogy I'm thinking about here is, you know, to think about the system or the economy as a whole at a certain level, but you really need to get down and dirty with transactions, just like at some point, I mean, the physicists like to talk about you know, quantum mechanics and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, that's another great thing about accounting, especially financial accounting from the get go is it gets you down on a transaction level. It says, hey, you know, what exactly is going on in this transaction? You have to characterize it, right? 
So then maybe Rick, uh, I'll ask my fi no, final question and then we can, we can uh, let the audience ask. Um, so this distinction that you, you mentioned, uh, it's somewhat natural, almost like second nature when we do proper accounting, like the how we teach accounting and all that. You know, this is transaction with owners. And, um, but, but in some sense, I, I, I've never thought that there was a either economic theory or mathematical theory or whatever theory that 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 says that arrive at that solution, right? So that says that's the right thing to do, right? Satisfied, this is the optimal thing to do or something. So so that speaks to perhaps, am I sensing that this is um, kind of uh, something that information perspective has not offered us, right? Which is a theory of classification, a theory of like, separating things or a theory of uh, uh you know you know what i mean to so the, the separation yeah. as i recall this is a little hazy but i think i think jerry feltham's dissertations that might have been on aggregation or at least had part of it on, on, on aggregation right so you know that used to be a huge issue a topic of accounting theorists you know what should we aggregate what do we combine with what and by and large i think that's kind of gone away partly because we don't really know that, you know, we had some tools that I think made we made tremendous progress on, on understanding the world with, but we kind of there are these limits to it, right? And 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 in particular, if if so, for aggregation, you could say, well, as long as you aggregate something in, and what you end up with is is a sufficient statistic, then you haven't really destroyed any information. Okay, fine, we can do that, right? But we do destroy information. How do you want to do that? You know, creatively, and there I think is where. It's easy to see the, say the problem. It's hard to figure out what to do with it, right? But you know, by now, uh, and I think some economists and others are trying to think about, you know, ways of not, you know, basically backdooring in some type of information processing cost or something in a in a decent way. I mean, the trouble the reason we never did that is because how you know. It's just too easy to get a result by throwing in some weird assumptions or whatever. So the whole idea of of of, of having models where people are rational and maximizing and so forth is basically not to cheat and, and make too simple an, an, an assumption. But uh, but anyway, these are these are big problems. Yeah, great. So maybe uh, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over, uh, Robert. You you asked you asked a next question in the chat. Could you maybe? Uh, tell it to Rick. I don't think Rick is following the chat that much. Robert? Oh, yeah, I can I can repeat it. So I was, hi, Rick. Uh, hi, Robert. Thanks for your interesting insight. So I, I was just wondering what we could do to, to make the information uh, uh, models that we study more accounting specific. So is there something that you can kind of say? Because sometimes I, I, I look at, uh, I don't want to blame any sort of model, but often you have a a, 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 a variable y that is some fundamental plus noise that could be anything, uh, uh, but it's not uh, obvious that this is really that we're really talking about accounting here, right? And and I think I think uh, Ki Chen has some at some point or, or also written that down that we need progress on that dimension. Perhaps you have some advice on that. So how, what wow. could we do to to improve that? <laughs> first, of all, first of all, I you know I completely agree, and this is you know one of the reasons that I like Ping Yang Gao's uh, two-step representation stuff is that he's trying to get a little bit into the information production process. So the reason I think we teach MBA students financial accounting, and we should, by the way, I, I'm much more of a fundamentalist about doing this than we, we, we turn out to do, is because that in order to use the output of accounting systems, you, because they're not many numbers are not directly meaningful because they're not measures really they're quantifications you have to understand how those numbers are produced it's not what the numbers are it's what they mean and what they mean may or may not mean what you think they mean and so you got to dig into it so um i mean i think robert i think you asked you know just a great question if i if i would have cracked that problem i would have loved to have done it <laughs> Uh, or I, I'd, I'd, I'd probably be trying to do it now, but I think that's the real thing, place we need to get to, because, you know, the thing that we'd love to understand somehow is this, all the structure we put on the accounting process itself. You know, um, 
imposing the accounting identity, making sure things true up and so forth. So, you know, some of my early work, a lot of which was, by the way, inspired by a paper that I saw Bob McGee do called The Auditor as an Economic Agent. And we won't get into the fact that I ended up stealing his title. Um, not my fault, I'm just saying. But, um, you know, but, but we, would, we would try to explain things through the accounting production process. Like, okay, um, and, and by the way, I think that's where a lot of the answer to that lies, right? Uh, why do we impose a restriction? May not, may not be, uh, let's talk about that for a second. I mean, you know, it may not be because that's what the people demanding it are, is good for. Maybe that's the only kind of information we can produce. Right, and maybe this, maybe all of these things are, that we do, the structure of accounting, is is due to try to make to give the accounting process itself some integrity. So we could we can get at things like that if we choose to. Um, uh, and again, that's you know Ping Yang's two step representations in an attempt to do that to say, look, you know, in certain circumstances, you can um, you can have a cutoff rule. It's another good example where we either recognize something or we don't. You know, we don't like half recognize it, right? So, to the extent that you that you are the thing you're explaining, the why starts having some specialized properties that you could say, well, this is like an accounting process. Now, you know, we don't have, you know, I don't think accounting processes are unique in the information production world, but they have some pretty special characteristics. Um, you know, that probably we should, you know, maybe try to understand. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question or not, but I, I, I never, I think personally, I think we need some breakthroughs on this. And, and I think they're going to probably come at, you know, maybe even a different kind of model, uh, you know, that I always just fall back on information processing costs or, or there's some moral hazard in production. Right. Those are, this is the way we, this is the only way that we know to sort of explain any sort of details. So yeah. we're, we're, we're running out of time. So we have Sorry. two, two, uh, two uh, chat uh, entries that I, I'd like to bring up. So Justin, you made a very nice point about this language uh, point, but uh, I don't see a question, but, but I would like re really for you to, oh, to share that. Uh, and it's then just a maybe next, yeah. yeah. Just on the information destruction that it's sort of inherent when you have like, so let's say, you know, dumping a ledger on everybody's doorstep versus the financial statements, the financial statements are standardized, which is right. similar like languages, if right. you use like one language, it's going to eliminate some nuances. Right. But it, it lets you communicate to a broader audience. And that's in a sense, you know, some of what accounting is doing that in addition to the aggregation, just it's an efficient transmission recognition, which I think falls under the umbrella of the uh, processing costs that you yeah, had mentioned. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that completely. And, you know, we, we define terms. And then what the first footnote of the accounts is trying to explain to people kind of some, some, some nuances of the particular instantiation of the language in this case, right? This is how we're recognizing revenue. This is how we're doing this. This is how we're doing that. So you, you construct a whole system within which that those discussions and that inform that can take place and that information can be processed yeah so that makes you makes you also want to look at the language aspect of accounting so ming lei and then i saw zhe chong also raised her hands and so maybe we'll go that in in that order thanks so um yeah thank you for the interesting insight uh, uh professor Antel. um the i I, I noticed maybe you said uh, the there there is not really a production efficiency uh, from the joint provision of audit and non audit service, and uh, what matters is the market externality. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, it, you know, I just uh, you know there, it, I'm not saying there aren't zero uh, uh, productive efficiencies, but you know, but even when there are. <laughs> When, when there are none, uh, it, it, it's just that the accounting firms can get the attention of decision makers high enough in large organizations. And again, now this was the context of selling something to uh, you know, public, big publicly traded corporations. They could get the attention of the appropriate decision makers to pitch their spiel to and and I could we couldn't a lot, you know. We just like 
now we don't even want to hear what you have to say. So it's that it's that's what I mean by the competition. So let me give you one last one fact about that. So in this work with the accounting firms, um, I some of the some of the about the auditor independence and their consulting and so forth. Uh, some of it happened not long after Arthur Anderson Anderson Consulting left, and then eventually Arthur Anderson, the audit firm, and eventually it became Accenture. Okay, so uh, and this these are the data that I could see it, that four years after Anderson Consulting completely left the audit side, so. There were no, there was no consulting left in Arthur Anderson, the audit firm. Four years after that, their consulting, the consulting revenues of Arthur Anderson, the audit firm, were equal to their audit revenues. So in four years, I think about like a starfish, they regrew their arm, they regrew, regrew their consulting arm. Now it's kind of hard to tell a production story. I, I didn't realize, but thank you for asking me this question, because I never realized until now. It's hard to sell to tell a production story because they also lost all their consulting people. So, so, so how did that information get trans? You know, so if it's productive information, they would that's that's really driving it. They would have had to retrain a whole group of people. They didn't have to do that. All they rebuilt in four years. That was that astonished me. So that told me that there's some very powerful economic force, you know, going on here. And it has to do with the markets for these kinds of services, right? That that there's a lot of friction and transactions costs, and uh, in, in terms of you know hiring somebody to produce accounting estimates for you, that um, you know you, I, I look for imperfections in that market, and, and and of course, like Schiller said, you always look for informational problems. Does that Thank help? You. I don't yeah. know. Help so, me. John, do you have? Tejun, do you have a question? We have two minutes left. Do you? Have oh yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. hi Rick. Yeah, yeah. Actually, hi. Uh, actually, like we have a lot of uh, opportunity to talk. Uh, you know, uh, I shouldn't okay. really uh, take this uh, uh, precious time, but like I was really intrigued. And uh, when you say that, you know, first uh, accounting is about destroying information, and yes. then. Uh, you know, in the aggregation process, uh, there's uh, this black box, the process of measurement is very much worth studying. And so here's my question, I think, you know, where do you think would be the more fruitful direction for future exploration regarding like, you know, how we exactly measure that matters and uh, uh, to open this black box? I guess like you mentioned the Pinyon's uh, two-step verification, which my understanding is this probably deals more with the manipulation incentive from the preparer, right? It's like to fight back on um, moral hazard. Uh, but like even if without moral hazard, uh, we still cannot really dump the ledger to the right. owners, right? right? So so I think that's another maybe possible approach, but I don't know what exactly that is. Like, can you maybe like just uh, elaborate a little bit where you think would be the possible, you know, major guidelines that we could use to uh, think about like what accounting is truly is, how distinguish right. us from like other, just a, a ton of information which we could produce. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, I, I, that, that's again, that's that's a great a great question, and and I tried to give a little sketch of where with the tools we have, you know, how could you explain sort of information destruction? But I just I don't have an answer for you. Uh, but I do know that again, people back back in the day, they were concerned with they knew like if if you talk to somebody who grew up being in a a, a real accountant. You know, they would know, well, I've got all these books and records of all these little bits and pieces of information, but how do I combine them into some meaningful reports and so on? And, uh, you know, I think that for good reason, we, we, we kind of put that problem aside. I think we need to make some progress on it. And I, I really don't, I really don't know how, uh, you know, I think that somehow lately I've been interested in, in how, um, behavior of systems emerges from the behavior of the small of the uh, the small right sort of the sort of emergent behavior and again the physicists are really interested in stuff like this it's like you know how does the behavior of a planet emerge from uh, quantum mechanics is they big problems with that uh, you know it seems like 
to me, to my knowledge, maybe sort of models like that might be more helpful, but I don't really know how or what they could be. You know, I mean, John Fellingham has taught me that physicists have, they encountered a problem with, with using sort of standard Bayesian analysis and invented things called like entanglement and so forth. You know, I think that's a possibility. Maybe we can see how, um, uh, maybe some of the things we do are driven by forces. This is, let me put this in a different way. Maybe some of the things we do are driven by forces that are kind of more outside of our awareness. You know, that is, uh, we've been trying to build everything from individuals rationally modeling, go, you know, going up one step at a time. And, and, and maybe we need to try to pitch a theory at a different level instead of trying to start with every individual and, and, and build things up from the ground. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but, so, and, and that Rick, that's a big problem, yeah. Rick, Rick we're, we're running out of time. So I, as I'm gonna abuse my uh, privilege as a, as, a, as a host to just pose one question without answer. Um, 1964, uh, four people out of Chicago, so you know all of them probably, uh, Cindy Davison, David Green, Chuck Hongren, and George Sorter wrote a book uh, and it, its first question that they ask is, does a unified theory of accounting exist? Can it exist? Uh, what should it look like? So I, did, I just want to put that on the table. That's 60, 1964. Um, we may not be able to answer them uh, uh, now, but, but I think it's still worth, uh, worth going after. 